Hello everyone. Thank you for watching another informative episode of The Fat Vegan Chef. Today I'm going to be talking about something that isn't especially vegan, but it's going to be useful, informative, and help keep you safe. I'm going to be talking about kitchen knives, safety, usage, and tips, and what you need in your kitchen, what to look for when purchasing them. I have split this video in three sections, and I'm going to show you the menu so you can jump to whatever section that you would find useful, so you don't have to sit through the entire video. I thought that the first thing that I would talk to you about is the most important, knife safety. This is the most basic thing every chef is taught. And when I went to culinary art school, we spent the first few weeks about nothing about knife safety. And the number one rule when it comes to knife safety, and it may sound a little counterintuitive, is that you need to keep your knife sharp. The sharper the knife, the safer you're going to be. And the reason being is when you are cutting, when the knife is sharp, it's gonna cut right through the food. But when it's dull, you're gonna put pressure on it and it's gonna cause your knife to slip and hit your fingers or slip off the board or whatever. And so you want to cut with as little force as possible depending upon what you're cutting. So the weight in the knife and the sawing motion should be all that you need to cut most food. And this is gonna be shown in further detail later on in the video. Chefs also use a steel rod to hone their knives, and this lines up the edge on the knife to keep the knife sharp. You do not need a steel that is actually this long. You can find an eight inch steel rod and it'll be just fine for, for what you're doing. I just happen to have a long knife, so I need a long rod. Basically, to sharpen your knife, what you want to do is place a towel on the counter like what I have here underneath my cutting board and place your rod on the uh, damp towel and this will keep the rod from slipping and then you want to hold your knife uh, between your thumb and your finger like this and this is like the perfect to hold it as you're out actually cutting vegetables as well and then I use this as a guide and then I bring it down in a 45 degree angle. So if you plus, place your finger like that, that kind of gives you the, the right angle and gives you the right motion. And you basically just want to use your wrist to come down on the rod like this. And the more you do this, the more practice you get, the um, better you're going to get. And the sound that you're hearing is actually kind of the sound that you want. It's going to be a nice, good ringing sound. If you have the wrong angle, and I'm not pushing hard against the steel, I'm basically just almost resting it against the steel. And that's really all you need. And you do this 15 to 20 times and your knife will be sharp. A lot of professional cooks, you'll see them hold the steel and bring it towards them like this. And I wouldn't recommend this for most home cooks because there is a chance of you slipping and then hitting your finger even though there is a guard here sometimes this guard doesn't always work and you're going to hit your hand so most home cooks use your damp towel put your the tip of your steel in the damp towel that will keep it from slipping and do it like that that's the way that we were trained when i went to culinary art school and really depending upon how much you use your knife you should only have to do this once a month um, maybe once a week if, if you're cutting a lot but really that's all you need and you can kind of feel the edge of the knife and I don't know if you can hear this but that's kind of the sound that you want to hear as you run your finger on the edge of the knife And then that kind of lets you know, and you can, you'll be able to tell a dull knife from a sharp knife after you've done this for a while. And I'm not pushing into the knife; I'm just kind of scraping my finger against the edge of the, uh, the edge of the blade. Now, if for some reason 
you've sharpened the knife like this or you can see the big gashes in the knife itself that's when you're gonna need to get it professionally sharpened depending upon your area the best place to look to find a professional knife sharpener that does kitchen knives is to pop your head into a couple different restaurants ask the chef where they go to get their knife sharpened and then use that company. Some restaurants, especially chain restaurants, they actually have a service that rotates their knives out every week or two with fresh sharp knives. And usually those companies also do knife sharpening as well. You're usually gonna pay 10 to $20 per knife to get them professionally sharpened. They do sell stones, but those stones I don't really recommend for home users because they have a tendency of really damaging your knife if you don't do it right. So get it professionally done. Usually I'd say once every six months to once every year is all you need to get it professionally sharpened so you're not doing it once a month or anything else like that it's like maybe once a year so you're spending 10 to 20 dollars a knife once a year and that keeps them really really sharp another really important safety tip when you're working with your knife is if you accidentally drop your knife you're not going to reach out and try to grab it best thing to do is to step back and away and let the knife fall. It's better to break the tip of the knife like I have done on mine than it is to get cut. You don't want to cut your hand, you don't want to cut your foot. You know, a lot of injuries that happen in the kitchen is from a knife hitting somebody's toe or somebody trying to grab the knife to keep it from falling. And these knives, like I said, very sharp. If you reach out and grab it and try to catch it, you're gonna cut your hand. There's no doubt about it, you're gonna cut your hand. You're gonna cut your foot if you aren't wearing a steel-toed boot. It's gonna go through your shoe. You know, so it's better to let it hit the floor and when it stopped moving, go ahead and pick it up, clean it off, sanitize it, check for damage, and then continue using it. And more than likely, you're gonna break the tip of your knife. You're gonna bend the tip of your knife. If you bend the tip of your knife, go to a professional knife sharpener and they will take that tip off and uh, sharpen it and give it a good edge you know more than likely if you do drop it on the floor you are going to have to at least run it on your steel to uh, to rehone it and you may have to get it freshly sharpened you know accidents happen knives do drop i drop my knife every once in a while myself but again to keep yourself safe step away and knife drops step back let it fall okay Now that I have gone over keeping your knife sharp, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to some more knife safety. And that actually has to do with the cutting board. Now I'm using a plastic board here and it's a full size kitchen board. You can just use a regular board. Wood or plastic is fine. I prefer plastic just because wood you have a little bit more care that has to be used in them because bacteria can get inside the grains of the wood so you just have to make sure you're keeping it sanitary a little bit more i prefer plastic just for that reason it's more sanitary now in every single video that i have done that requires some kind of preparation i always tell you to keep a damp towel underneath the cutting board and the reason why that you want to keep a damp towel underneath the cutting board is pretty simple. It's going to keep the board from slipping for the most part. So if your board slips underneath you, you have more of a chance of cutting yourself. So, and I'll show you here. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the, the damp towel and put the board down. And you can see it has a lot more ability to kind of slide around, whereas if you put the towel underneath, you're not going to get that, that play. It's a lot more steady. So, we always want to keep a damp towel underneath your cutting board. And also, like I showed, demoed to you before, when you pick up your knife, pick it up in between your thumb and your finger like this, and then grip it. And then you've got full control over your knife. And you're going to want to do this, hold your knife like this 
for just about every single cut that you do. And also, when you uh, cut your vegetables, you want to keep your fingers and uh, curl underneath this and then use your knuckles as a guide. And when you cut vegetables, if at all possible, do not raise your knife above your knuckles. If you raise your knife above your knuckles, then you're going to cut your knuckles. So you want to use your knife as a guide and kind of chop like this. And if you're left-handed, it's going to be the same thing, except you're reversing your hands. Basically, do kind of like a clawing motion and then with that clawing motion you rest your knife against your knuckles and with practice this will become a lot easier and I don't know if you can see my hand or not but I have several scars from actually cutting the tips of my fingers from uh, them slipping out from underneath me and my knife cutting you don't want to have you don't want to cut your fingers if at all possible so remember you know you can practice doing this you know you want to do it in a nice rocking motion when you're cutting through your vegetables and like I said this is the technique that you're going to use most of all that will keep you from cutting your your fingers and it will also give you more control and make your cuts on your vegetables and your fruit a lot more even and precise so like I said it takes practice and you're not going to get it right the, the first few times that you try it but the more that you do it the more that you consciously make the effort to hold your knife and to hold your hand properly then the more easier and the more natural it's going to come to you and the better you will be in cutting your vegetables so that leads me to the next segment where I'm going to show you some different cutting techniques so when you read a recipe and you see that it's supposed to be julienne or small dice or big dice you'll, you'll know what the recipe is talking about so let's go ahead and uh, go on to that section of the video I'm going to show you some varying uh, knife skills I'm going to start off with something a little bit simple and start off with some tofu and this is a firm block of tofu that I have gone ahead and pre-drained first thing you want to do is always be aware of where your hands are again when we talked about holding the knife you want to hold it like this and then grip it and then that way you've got full control over your knife your fingers can go back and forth like this and then you've got a firm grip on it. Now this is one of those rare times where you're going to take your knife off of the cutting board. You almost always want to keep your knife on the cutting board. But since this is so tall, then we're going to have to take our knife off the cutting board. And again, what you want to do is put your fingers in like a claw. Hold it on the tofu or on your vegetable. And then in a sawing motion, let the knife do all the work. and I'm putting little, if any, pressure on the actual tofu itself. So now we're gonna do it again. Sawing motion, down. Sawing motion, down. Just like that. sawing motion down. Keep your knuckles curved. Keep your fingers behind your knuckles. Don't ever, if at all possible, don't put your fingers out like this because you will cut your fingers. Using your you're using your knuckles as a guide. And I'm going to repeat this several more times in the video so in that way that kind of gets through to you. You want to use your knuckles as a guide. Keep your fingers sucked in. You want to like do a claw and you're using your fingers as a guide or your knuckles as a guide to make sure that your dice gets pretty even mm -hmm. and then always work clean. This is not only for sanitary purposes but also safety as well. If you've got a messy cutting board you can get to a point where you really can't see what you're doing. 
Now I'm going to show you some techniques in cutting vegetables. And while you watch this video, pay attention to how I'm cutting the vegetables. My hands, the size of the vegetables, that kind of thing. So I think I'll start with something, uh, something round here, like this carrot. So you're thinking, okay, well, I got this vegetable that's rolling around. How am I going to cut this properly? Well, to start out with, what you can do is take just a tiny little chunk of the vegetable and take a little piece out of it. And this will help keep it from rolling around. So now you've got a more steady surface to actually do your cuts with. And carrots can be particularly hard, so you know it is going to take a little bit more force than just the force of the knife to cut through it. But still, if you've got a sharp knife, it should just go ahead and just almost cut through it uh, pretty easily. And I'm not really using that much force at all because I have a sharp knife. And then what you can do with these, with these little bits, if you want to, you can, um, you can add them in there or you can put them in your composter or whatever. And then another thing that you can do is Once you have your little surface there, if you need to cut it in half or whatever, then you've got a more even surface to cut it in half. And then now you've got your uh, vegetable cut in half. If it's requiring like a small dice, you can then cut it in half again. But you have that flat surface that you're now working with to keep the vegetable from uh, rolling around. And as you can see, I like to use my knife as kind of a scoop. And when I'm scooping, I have the knife running along the edge in about a 30 to 45 degree angle instead of like this. If you do it like this, you're going to cut yourself. So scrape the edge of the knife against the cutting board. It's not going to dull the knife to a point to where uh, you're going to need to have it resharpened, especially if you keep it at that angle. Now, if you were to do something like this, then yes, you're going to ruin the edge of your knife. But you want to scrape it like this, not like this. Alright, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, different dice sizes. And I'm going to use this pepper as an example. I'm just going to go ahead and get it uh, prepared. Here. Let me take the stick off. And as you can see, the way that I cut the pepper, you know, I pretty much cut it so that the little insides are still are part of this core here. So for the most part, you have most of the white stuff off of the pepper. You have a little bit of it, but you know, that's a nice little technique when you're cutting peppers is to cut it like that. And then you can also just kind of grab these little top there. So now we have our pepper here and I always like to cut it with the skin side down. Then that way you have a better, it's easier to cut through the vegetable instead of trying to fight the skin, cutting it this way you are actually already have your stroke going through and it will cut through the skin a lot easier and you have less of a chance of cutting yourself. So a large dice is pretty much like that. <laughs> now medium dice is 
things like that. Now let's go ahead and go through our, to our small dice. There are small dice. If they ask for a julienne or strips, then you can just go like this. And there's our julienne or our strips when it comes to peppers. Now there is a, another julienne to where it's a lot smaller of a cut, but for a pepper, that's that's usually what I do. So there's our different dices, large, medium, small, julienne, and then rough chop is just kind of, rough chop is, a, is, a, is I usually keep it around a medium dice, but it doesn't have to be as precise. So something like that would be like a rough chop. And usually you'll see rough chops when you're going to be puring up the vegetables or the vegetables are going to be just for flavoring or whatever. Now here we have a zucchini, and it's going to be another one of those to where you can take a side of the zucchini very carefully, and then now you've got a surface area to work with. Now I'm going to move on to one of the more complicated vegetables, and that's an onion. And when you're professionally trained, you're taught to leave this on. I personally like to take it off, but I'm going to leave it on here to kind of hold your, your vegetable together. And as you watch me do these different techniques, kind of follow what I'm doing with my hands, especially uh, my left hand. Watch what it's doing. Now, I'm gonna show you how they teach us how to cut an onion in, professionally in a school, and then I'll show you my little shortcut. Now, professionally, what they do is they have you cut like this, and then watch, watch my hand. So I've got it holding the onion down and putting some pressure on the onion to keep it from sliding. And you want to use your palm as you're holding it because that way when you get up to the top here you don't have the risk of hitting your fingers. You're, you know, you've got less surface area and you've got it like this so you're not going to really cut yourself because it's going to get caught into, your, in, into the palm there. So depending upon the size of the dice, you're going to take it again in a sawing motion and you're going to cut. And then you're going to take your knife, again using your fingers as a guide. Now, again, cut down. And 
and then you've got the root end that you can then put in your compost heap. And see how I'm using my knife as a scoop? I'm using it in a 30 to 45 degree angle, not straight flat across because that's going to dull your knife. 30 to 45 degree angle and you're scooping it. Now I'm going to show you how I do it. I completely skip cutting it like this because I actually cut it in a diagonal depending upon how the onion is curved. So I follow the curvature of the onion. And then I go ahead and cut it down like this. Compost heap. And it has the same effect. And that is part of the safety too is if you've got a bunch of stuff on your board, if you're trying to cut a bunch of things all at the same time and you've got them all on your board, then you have a chance of cutting yourself because you don't have enough space to work. And that's why I like this large board too because this is my workspace. This is what I'm currently cutting now. And I try to keep it clean except for whatever I'm cutting at the time. And everything else is pushed to the side here. So, I kind of work from one side to the other. So I've got my vegetables I'm going to prep over on this side, my prepping station here, and then what I'm finished what's finished over on this side. So then that way there's organization. So now we're going to move on to garlic. And garlic is a different beast altogether. Now, when most recipes call for garlic to be minced, and it's pretty straightforward. You've got your garlic and instead of trying to work and try to take this peel off, let the knife work for you. Put your knife down with the flat palm, push against the knife, and then you've got the peel that's easier to come off with the garlic. Now what you can do is give it kind of a rough chop at first. And then take your, hold your knife like this and take it and you've got kind of a, a minced garlic. So you're going to go ahead and take another piece of garlic and I'm going to do a different technique. Again, take off the skin. And then what you can do is take it and hit it pretty hard. And go through and give it a nice little chop. And as you can see in this technique, I'm using kind of a rocker and I'm holding the knife and that kind of helps me control the knife as to where I am where I'm mincing the garlic. And again, I'm being mindful where I'm placing my finger on the knife. I'm not placing it on the edge, I'm just placing it on the side. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and move on to a chiffonade, which is almost like a julienne, and I'm going to use my basil plants to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and pick off a couple of good basil leaves. And then what you want to do is start out with some of the larger leaves, put them on the bottom, and then work in 
into the smaller leaves and then roll it. Roll your basil together like that. Now using your knife and your fingers, cut it really finely. like that and that is a chiffonade so if you ever see a recipe that calls for a chiffonade that's what they mean it's kind of like a julienne now we're going to go ahead and mince some cilantro and this is going to cover another knife technique and usually what I like to do just to make things quick is I'll just take whatever I'm mincing and I'll kind of chop around it and then if you want to go through this to get the rest you can do that I'm not going to do it for this demonstration so we've got our cilantro and what you want to do is in a rocking motion go through bring whatever you're mincing back together again go through and if you notice I'm using both hands here I'm using one for the actual direction and I'm using the other one to kind of hold the knife where it needs to be so this is holding the knife where it needs to be And you're just going to repeat this process until you've got a nice mince and whatever you're mincing. And this is the same for cilantro or oregano, basil, parsley, anything that you want to mince. Garlic would be the same way if you're going to be mincing a lot of garlic. And the reason why I'm kind of doing a few different strings together so I'm kind of mixing it in there to make sure I've got a good and even mint. And a few times you do want to wipe your knife down as well sometimes larger leaves will get on your on your knife so you want to make sure that you are doing that and again I'm scraping along the edge of the knife but I'm not bringing my finger against the knife to cut I'm just going on the on the same plane as the blade if you're not comfortable with rubbing your fingers against the edge of the knife you can use like a um, butter knife or something like that. Just make sure you're not rubbing right up against the edge. I've shown you a few different knife cutting tips and techniques. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what to look for when purchasing knives and what kind of knives that you may need in your kitchen. Alright, let's go ahead and get into some knife buying tips. First of all, you don't need to buy an expensive two or three hundred dollar knife. You don't need to buy a Hinkles or a Warstoff Trident. I do have a few Hinkles in my collection, but my daily driver knife, the one that I use most often and that you will see in all my videos, is Victorinox. Victorinox is made by the same company that makes Swiss Army knives. And when I bought it in the mid 90s, I think I spent maybe $40 for it. It is made with the same high grade steel that you see in all the expensive brands. It stays sharp, it's in great shape, and I recommend spending the extra money to buy a good sturdy knife than what you would find at your local box store or whatever that is like a five or ten dollar knife. You need to buy a good a good knife in the $40 to $50 range, like Victoria Knox, you can find them 
at knife buying place or online at like Amazon or a restaurant supply store or something like that. Those flimsy knives that you see in stores, they're just, they're, they're, they're just not gonna work. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get into my tool bag here. Here's my trusty knife, um, the one that I use every day. Again, it's Victoria Knox, and I've had it since the uh, early 90s. I've used it so much that even the label that says Victoria Knox has been worn away. Now I want to show you with this knife some things to look for uh, when buying a knife. First of all, make sure depending upon the length that it has two or three rivets and you can see, um, well with the wooden handle at least, some of the plastic handles you may not be able to see this, but with the three rivets you can see that the blade actually goes back all the way to the back of the handle. You want to make sure of that because in that way your knife isn't going to slip out of the handle. A lot of times when you buy a knife from the local grocery store or box store like Walmart or Target or some Kmart or some place like that, the knife is basically held in place with some plastic or maybe one rivet right here and that's not going to be very very steady very sturdy this with the knife going all the way back I know that I've got a good hold of the blade okay and sometimes you will not see the rivets but it may be advertised on the package itself that the knife is a full shank so you want to make sure it says full shank on the um, on the package Again, you want to buy a knife that says that it's made with high carbon stainless steel. High carbon stainless steel. And as you can see with this knife, it has a little bit of a play, but not a lot. And so if, unless you're buying a specialty knife, like a fish knife, which you can use to cut fruit or whatever, you're not gonna get a lot of play in your knife, okay? So let's talk about the chef knife. It's going to be your number one tool. It's going to be your daily driver. And this is going to be the knife that you use most often. And so this is where you definitely want to make sure that you are spending the most time and care and money. Again, not real expensive, not $200 worth of money, but the most money in. So make sure that you look for those properties. High carbon stainless steel, full shank knife. I bought a nice wooden one, and you can buy one with the, with the plastic handle if you want. That part doesn't really make any difference. The wooden one was a little bit cheaper, I think, but I like the way that it looks. Now, another thing is the length of the knife. This is a long knife, it's a big knife. You don't need to buy a knife this big. The reason why I bought a knife this big is because when I showed you earlier in the video of mincing the cilantro, when I was in the kitchen, I used to mince a lot of parsley, a lot of cilantro, and so this gives me more surface area to cut. I do have a couple of shorter knives, like this Gerber here. It's an eight inch knife. Again, it's got the full shank. I use the longer knife just because it's what I it's what I'm more comfortable with using a long knife you may not be comfortable with an 8 inch knife is just fine you don't need anything long so I've got another 8 inch here and then the reason why I've got three chef knives by the way it's because what I can do and this is like a more advanced technique was when I was mincing a lot of parsley and I was mincing a whole box at a time I could take these three knives and hold them together and basically I'm cutting three cuts for one. Plus sometimes when you're doing a little bit more delicate work where a paring knife is just too small, but this may be a little bit too big, a good eight inch chef knife does the job. So I do have varying lengths of knives just for that purpose to where I may need something a little bit smaller than this big 12 inch chef knife. So an eight inch would be perfect for what you need. All of these knives, which you'll find in the professional line, are balanced really good. 
so they feel nice and balanced in the hand. You've got more control over it. The back isn't too heavy. The knife itself isn't too heavy. It's got a nice balance and feel to it. And you'll, you'll feel that when you are looking for knives. So you don't want anything that, that is like really light and you don't want anything to where it's ill balanced either. So, you know, it is going to be a little bit heavy in the handle and that's what you want. The knife, since it's thinner, is going to be a little bit lighter, more lighter. The, that gives you more control. You want a handle that has a little bit of weight to it. You want a knife that has a little bit of a weight to it. Now let's go ahead and move on to the paring knife. And you want a good three or four inch paring knife. And this will help you cut small, smaller items and do delicate work, like if you're doing strawberries or you're making flowers or that kind of thing. And if you're gonna do any decorative designs, you know, making roses out of tomatoes or whatever, this is going to be your best tool for that job. You're not going to, I'm not going to do this with a chef knife. I'm going to do it with a curry knife. So, you know, and again, this curry knife, three rivets, the shank goes all the way to the back. And again, it's got a good balance on it. That's my curry knife. The knives that we're going to need so far are a chef knife and a curry knife. Again, we got the steel. And again, as I mentioned before, you don't need a big, long steel. I have a big long steel, so I have a big long knife. An a 8 to a 10 inch long steel is all you're going to need when you're using an 8 inch knife. The next knife that you're going to need is a bread knife. And again, you don't need one this long. You know, one that's maybe 10, 8 to 10 inches long is really all you need. Now, unless you know that you're going to be cutting a lot of long breads all the time. You don't really need one this long. And this is a generic knife. It is high carbon stainless steel. I did buy it at a restaurant supply store. And you want to want find one that scallops like this and this will help you go through through the bread, especially hard crusty bread. And I actually have kind of a, a steak knife as well that has a sharper points and this is especially good for those really hard crusty breads that something like this might damage where it's um, really soft on the inside and crusty on the outside and again this is a generic knife this is kind of like my utility knife actually i think i found this in the used bin at the restaurant supply store it's pretty beaten up but a good bread knife and these bread knives bread knives anything that scallops like this you do not want to run on a steel. They can be professionally sharpened, but normally, since they're scalloped like this, they do keep their edge, unless you're really doing something really damaging to the knife, which you don't want to do anyway. You want to use these for bread, and they'll basically stay sharp. Again, this serrated knife that I use, I also use it for more difficult items. It's also really good for ripping through tomatoes as well, just because the tomatoes have that hard skin and they're soft on the inside it will tear it will go through the tomatoes and i don't find that the tomatoes get damaged when you're using a serrated knife versus a chef knife or a paring knife because these sharp teeth will will cut through the skin and it won't damage the inside so that's a good tip for cutting tomatoes is to use a serrated knife when you want to keep the tomatoes looking good like for sandwiches or whatever else like that that's good all right so the knives that i think that every kitchen needs is going to be number one the steel which technically isn't a knife but this is important it keeps your knives uh, nice and sharp steels do wear out over time so if your knife isn't really getting the edge it may be time to replace your steel but usually these will last for years and years and years so just keep that in mind. You need a good chef knife. This is going to be the knife that you use every single day. 40, 60 bucks is all you really need to spend on a good chef knife. Again, buy a professional one. This knife you will pass down through generations if you treat it right. Good paring knife. This is for more delicate work, cutting strawberries, doing roses, intricate designs, that kind of thing. You need a good bread knife. And then you need a good utility knife. Again, you don't need to buy knives that are this long. Now let me go ahead and show you 
some of the other knives that I have in my tool kit. Before I was vegan and when I was working in the restaurant industry, I would do a lot of carving. I would be at the carving station. This is one of my Hinkles. I think I spent $150, $200 on this. But this is a, a meat carving knife. And then along with it, I have the fork as well. And this fork, another Hinkles. And the reason why I've spent so much money on these is because when I was working in the restaurant, I would be outside in front of public. So I had something good and high quality as a professional chef. And these have stayed sharp throughout the years. Another good thing that you need in your toolkit is a thermometer. It's not technically a knife, but you want a good calibrated thermometer. Make sure things are where they should be as far as temperature goes. So you see this on me almost all the time. I'm checking temperatures, make sure things are hot enough. This is another good utility knife that I have used over the years. This is kind of like that in-between knife, in between a paring knife and a chef knife. This knife I would use to cut through smaller things like maybe smaller fruits and vegetables. So this is like an in-between knife between a chef and a paring knife when neither one of these would be a good suitable candidate. And again, these are optional. I'm just showing you what I have in my toolkit. This is another knife that I keep in my toolkit. It is shaped a little bit differently than what you would normally see for a knife. I use this for decorations. When you're cutting through fruit or vegetables, it will scallop it. Good for uh, scalloping potatoes, that kind of thing. And like I said, this is not a necessary knife, but it's something that I have needed to use over the years. Uh, for decorative work. That is most of the knives that I keep in my tool kit. My daily driver again is my chef knife. Everything else I kind of keep packed away until needed. If you have any questions or comments about anything that you've seen in this video, please comment on the video or on my webpage and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. If you have any questions about buying knives, what to look for, that kind of thing. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that you found it useful. You can find this video and a whole lot more at thefatveganchef.com. If you saw this video on social media, please like and share the video. Let your friends and family know about this. They may find it useful as well. If you found this video extremely useful, save yourself a couple hundred dollars on buying an expensive knife. Please consider donating some of that savings to the Fat Vegan Chef. You can find that information at tfbc.org forward slash donate. Even if you found the video useful and you want to give me a dollar, that's perfectly fine. I accept donations of all sizes. It helps keep me going, helps keep the lights on, helps me buy ingredients. So that's again tfbc.org forward slash donate. You can find me at all of your favorite social media sites at the Fat Bean Chef. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Hello, Snapchat, just about everywhere that you can can find us. Subscribe, have your friends subscribe. I would certainly appreciate that. And again, thank you very much. Now let's get cooking.